This video is brought to you by Thrive Fantasy, proud partners of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Thrive is all about player props for the top tier athletes, so you don't have to spend countless hours of research on sleeper players. The more props you win, the more points you receive. Thrive has given away $4 million in cash prizes and has tons of money guaranteed for week two of the NFL season. Use the promo code JG9 when you sign up to receive a 100% instant first deposit match up to $100. Download the app or go to thrivefantasy.com. Sign up and prop up today. And now, on with our feature presentation. When you think of the greatest comeback season in the history of the Green Bay Packers, odds are, the first thing that comes to mind is something that didn't happen too long ago. You probably think of the incredible 2016 season that wide receiver Jordy Nelson had. In 2015, Nelson tore his ACL and missed the entire season, but bounced back stronger than ever the following year. He finished that season with 97 receptions for 1,257 yards and 14 touchdowns finishing 5th in receptions, 6th in receiving yards, and 1st in receiving touchdowns. To date, Nelson is the only player in Packers history to ever be named the AP Comeback Player of the Year, an award he thoroughly deserved. However, there is another incredible player comeback in franchise history that doesn't get talked about a whole lot, and has been forgotten throughout NFL and Packer history, but might be just as remarkable, if not more so. Entering the 1984 season, Packers running back Eddie Lee Ivory was facing almost unfathomable adversity. He had troubles in his personal life. He had to check into rehab and missed a ton of playing time. And one year later, after dealing with that and some nasty injury luck, he came back and was one of the top running backs in the National Football League. This is the story behind the remarkable comeback of Eddie Lee Ivory. Before I talk about this comeback, we need some context to understand just who Eddie Lee Ivory is, how he was playing before everything went down, and just what made this redemption arc so incredible to witness. In 1979, the Packers wanted to draft a running back after having a somewhat lethargic ground game that finished in the bottom half of the league in almost every major category. They wanted to boost a rushing attack that had no one outside of Pro Bowler Turdell Middleton. With that, they spent their first round pick on Georgia Tech running back Eddie Lee Ivory. He was coming off of an incredible 1978 season where he received some votes for the Heisman and finished fourth in the country in rushing yards. Many people were expecting Ivory to do some big things in the NFL. The good news for the Packers was that when he was on the field, Ivory was a pretty good running back. During the 1980 season, he was a solid dual threat, recording over 800 rushing yards and over 4 yards per carry, and having 50 receptions for just under 500 yards. He knew how to take care of the football, only fumbling 3 times on 252 touches, and was one of the better backs in football. In fact, if you looked at every running back in 1980 to have at least 50 receptions, 4 yards per carry, and 800 rushing yards, the list would consist of just 5 names. William Andrews, Billy Sims, Mike Pruitt, Ted Brown, and none other than Eddie Lee Ivory. And in 1982, during the strike shortened season, Ivory was a big reason why the Green Bay Packers were able to make it into the postseason. He scored nine rushing touchdowns, which was the top total in the NFC, and was second in the NFL, only trailing Marcus Allen of the Los Angeles Raiders. Throw in a receiving touchdown he had, making it 10 touchdowns from scrimmage, and Ivory was one of just three players that year, alongside Allen and Los Angeles Rams running back Wendell Tyler, to average over a touchdown per game. When Ivory was on the field, he was an offensive weapon who could give Green Bay the offensive spark they needed. The bad news was that, unfortunately, Ivory had trouble staying on the field. Even though he had a very solid career, all things considered, many people point to Ivory's career as one of the greatest what-ifs of the 1980s, because he had some absolutely brutal injury luck. In his very first game in 1979 at Soldier Field against the Chicago Bears, he tore his left ACL, missing the rest of the season. And in his very first game in 1981, also at Soldier Field against the Chicago Bears, he tore ligaments in his left knee and once again had to miss the rest of the season. Out of the possible 48 games over his first three seasons, Ivory was only able to play in 18 of them. But to his credit, he was able to bounce back both times. After that devastating injury in 1979, he had a strong 1980 season. And after that devastating injury in 1981, he was a scoring machine in 1982. However, in 1983, he was about to face his biggest injury challenge yet. You could make the argument that the 1982 season was the best of Ivory's career up until this point. His team made it to the postseason for the first time in a decade thanks to him, and even won a playoff game, as he scored two touchdowns in their first round matchup against the St. Louis Cardinals. I talked at length about that game in a previous video of mine, so if you want to learn more about how the Packers won that one, then click the card in the upper right corner. If this was a 16 game season, he would have easily crossed 1,000 yards from scrimmage, and he was near the top of the league in scoring, becoming the top option on an offense that already had so many talented players on it, like Pro Bowl tight end Paul Kaufman, Pro Bowl wide receiver John Jefferson, and Hall of Famer James Lofton. Entering 1983, it seemed like Ivory was ready to pick up right where he left off. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that way. 
Through the first eight games of the season, the Packers were 4-4, perfectly alternating wins and losses each week. They had a negative point differential, sported the second worst defense in the NFL, having allowed an abysmal 233 points in that stretch, and were two back in the Minnesota Vikings for the division lead, although they would eventually go on to completely collapse down the stretch. And alongside the team struggling, Ivory struggled as well. Over his first eight games, he only scored a touchdown in one of them. He was averaging less than four yards per carry, and in his most recent five games, was playing what had to be the worst football of his career. In that stretch, Ivory never crossed 50 rushing yards, did not score a single rushing touchdown, and was only averaging three and a half yards per carry. And following a 20-17 loss to the Minnesota Vikings, Ivory decided that he was done. He needed to take some time off for himself, because he was emotionally strained. He left the team, and was placed on the non-football injury list. What was odd about the whole situation at first was that, on the surface at least, Ivory seemed to be completely fine. One reporter went to Ivory's home after news of this came out, and according to him, Ivory seemed to be under control and not upset. And according to Ivory, it had nothing to do with drugs or alcohol. He just had some personal things to take care of. As he said, I couldn't handle it anymore. I was at my limit. I wasn't performing real well. And a lot of things were going on in my life, and I just couldn't handle it anymore. However, one month later, the real truth would come out. Because unfortunately, it was reported that Ivory, like so many athletes who played in the NFL during the 1980s, was dealing with a serious cocaine problem. It takes a lot of courage and guts to admit when you have a problem, and that's exactly what Ivory did. One month after leaving the team, right as his time on the NFI list was coming to an end and he would have been eligible to play again, he announced that he was checking into the Hazelden Foundation Drug and Rehabilitation Center near Minneapolis. Ivory was scared that he was becoming chemically dependent on the drug, and he put his playing career on hold to kick this addiction as best as he could. When Ivory came out of rehab after undergoing 26 days of treatment, he was extremely apologetic, saying, I made a very serious mistake in my life. I got involved with the drug cocaine. Because of his time away from the team, his time in rehab, and his loss of conditioning during this entire process, Ivory would not play for the remainder of that 1983 season. When 1984 rolled around, the Packers got a new head coach, with Bart Starr being replaced by another Lombardi-era player in Forrest Gregg. And Gregg had nothing but praise for Ivory and his willingness to admit that he had a problem, saying, I admire guys who stand up and confess. It seemed as though 1984 would be a new start for Ivory, and it seemed like Ivory was going to do everything in his power to make this season a redemption tour of sorts. As he said, I've proven time and time again that I could bounce back from knee surgeries, but last year was something totally different. It was a personal problem. Now, I have to prove to myself first that I can bounce back from this thing. Unfortunately, Ivory's problems would continue to pile up. In August, he suffered another injury to his left knee, which forced him to miss a good chunk of the first half of the season. And just as it seemed like he was ready to come back, he had to deal with some more drama when a judge sentenced him to 10 days in jail for driving with a revoked license, although at least with that he could serve his sentence after the season ended. Ivory lost his license because of his accumulation of violations, and Greg was upset at the whole situation for Ivory, saying a ball player has to understand that they're expected to be above all that. I'm not happy about it. I don't want his personal life to affect his job out there. So just to recap where we are, Ivory hasn't played in over a year. In that time, he suffered an injury to his left knee, the third such major injury to that body part in the last five years, he's had to deal with court proceedings and an impending jail sentence, and he's had to deal with an addiction to cocaine that was destroying his life. There was no way when Ivory came back in 1984 that he would be any good, right? Well, prepare yourselves for one of the most remarkable comebacks in the over-century-long history of the Packers franchise. It started in his first game back against the Detroit Lions, when on just 9 carries, he ran for 116 yards and a 41-9 victory. For some perspective, in games where Ivory got at least 3 carries, this was easily the highest yards per carry average of his entire career, as he picked up an astonishing 12.9 yards per carry. And the 116 rushing yards set a career best for him in games played at home, whether it was at Lambeau Field or Milwaukee County Stadium. Pretty good start. And while he wouldn't eclipse 100 yards in any other game the rest of the season, he re-established himself as one of the most consistent running backs in football over the second half of the season. In the eight games that Ivory played, he had at least nine carries in all of them. In all eight of those games, despite getting a significant workload, he averaged at least four yards per carry. Remember, he was averaging less than four yards per carry in 1983. And here he was in 1984, not once dipping below that total or even coming close to doing so. He had a three-touchdown game against the Los Angeles Rams in a game where the Packers won convincingly 31-6. 
Over the first eight games, the Packers were 1-7 and, and were arguably the worst team in football. Over their next eight, they went 7-1, and one, somehow ending the season with a 500 record despite one of the worst starts in franchise history. That is not a coincidence that the moment Ivory was back, the Packers started playing really well. Over the second half of the season, Ivory had 552 rushing yards on 5.58 yards per carry, and he found himself in the end zone seven times in his final five games. For some perspective on how good Ivory was in the second half of 1984, there were only two running backs in that stretch to have over 500 rushing yards on over 5.5 yards per carry. One of them, as you might have been able to guess, was Eric Dickerson, who finished that season with 2,105 rushing yards, which to this day is the NFL record for most rushing yards in a single season. The other one? Eddie Lee Ivory. Ivory was so good and so efficient over the second half of the season that he was in a category all by himself alongside 1984 Eric Dickerson. It doesn't get too much better than that. One thing was clear though, regardless of how the rest of Ivory's career went, he had one of the greatest single season comebacks ever. Ivory played two more seasons in the NFL, and actually had a pretty decent 1985 campaign, where he had over 900 yards from scrimmage and averaged close to 5 yards per carry. However, once again, injuries would play a major part in his career. He was placed on injured reserve early in the 1986 season, had a rib injury later in the 1986 season, and was relegated to a receiving back, as 31 of his 35 touches that season were in the passing game. And after the 1986 season, Ivory never played in the NFL again. He was placed on IR prior to the start of the 1987 season, and that was the end of his near decade-long career in the NFL. Now, some people view the career of Eddie Lee Ivory as a tragedy, and it's easy to see why. Here you had this incredibly talented running back that, when healthy, was one of the best in all of football, and more than showed why the Packers drafted him in the first round all those years ago. You had a guy who knew how to play a role in the passing and running game, who knew how to hold onto the football, who knew how to make plays in the open field and bounce off of tacklers, and who could score at will, especially down by the goal line. And he just couldn't stay healthy. The injury bug struck him, and instead of being remembered as someone of a team legend, he's remembered as a guy that couldn't stay healthy. However, it's very easy with a change in perspective to view his career as a heroic triumph. Ivory had no business coming back in 1984, with all the injuries and personal and drug problems going on in his life, and playing at an insanely high level. Yet that's exactly what he did. As Ivory would later say, the Packers gave me the opportunity to get my life back in order. It's a great organization, and they helped me at the time. They were there for me. He overcame a ton of adversity just to step onto the field after a year off. And when he did, he was a fantastic player right up there near the top of the league. In 1984, against all odds, Eddie Lee Ivory and his football career were living together in perfect harmony. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jaguar9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping with the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.